Welcome to Morning Prime's Youth in Politics segment. My name is Trix Ingado. We usually take a look at matters youth and how they are affecting the current political climate and how things can be made better by those who are youthful and in power and those who are aspiring to get into power. We're going to have a very comprehensive look at some of the issues that affect young people by taking a look at some of the some of the issues that are affecting the, the young people by taking a look at some of the messaging also that is coming out of the political elite. Now joining me uh, for this discussion, our guests are going to be um, piling up on top of the one we already have. I'm just going to allow you to introduce yourself this morning. Thank you for joining me. Okay. Uh, thank you for hosting me. My name is Elijah Chege Karanja. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. from Nakuru County, aspiring yes. governor, Nakuru County, independent candidate. Okay, yeah. so what I would start off in your view is the situation when it comes to youth in uh, youth unemployment right now. When you look at the youth in uh, your locality in Nakuru, what do you see and are you happy with the situation? Not at all. Uh, mm -hmm. If we look at the youth in, in Kenya, I think 75% of the population is under 35. Yes. That means that's the kind of population we are talking about. Mm -hmm. So if you go in hard numbers, mm -hmm. you're talking about probably 35 to 40 million Kenyans. Yes. And these people... I mean, that's from the uh, 2019 census. Yeah, 2019. Probably bigger number. Right <laughs> yeah, now. probably, because yes. we are 49 million, then now we are 53. Yeah. So the number is expanding. Mm -hmm. But if you look at all the economic indicators... Yes. As the economy expands, mm -hmm. poverty is expanding in equal terms. For sure. And the problem is like the, the demographic that is experiencing most of the challenges is the youth. Mm -hmm. They cannot access jobs. Either they don't have the capital, they cannot access capital if they want to start businesses. Mm -hmm. Either they have challenges in education, like the county I come. Yes. We have a challenge in uh, tertiary education, which mm -hmm. is supposed as a matter of fact to prepare youth yes. for job opportunities. Right. We look like Nakuru County is 3.6. Yes. So we mean like for every child <laughs> that is joining study one, mm -hmm. we're talking like by the time to, they go to get courses that can make them employable, we just have 3.6 of them. Absolutely. And even when we have them qualified, mm -hmm. we don't have opportunities. Yes. So we need mechanisms in area of social uplift, other economic, uh, uh, other economic uh, uh, projects that will create jobs like value addition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, like I said, economic affairs, and most and foremost, enhancing technology. Because, yes. like my manifesto, good part of it is uh, to do with the uh, digital revolution. Mm -hmm. So I, I think personally, that's where we're gonna we need to focus so that we can give our uh, youth jobs. Okay, yeah. and also joining us this morning is the, is Mr. Siyad Abdullahi, who mm -hmm. is also a political aspirant. Um, tell us, what are you going for in this upcoming election? I am contesting for the gubernatorial race in Wajia County. Okay, mm -hmm. and as a young person yourself, yes. when you look at the unemployment issue in your locality, what do you see and how would you diagnose the problem? I, I think um, um, unemployment in Kenya in general is, is a chronic problem, but particularly youth unemployment. Yeah. You know, you, you find st statistics anywhere ranging from you know, 13 to maybe even up to 38% of Kenya's youth being unemployed. Yes. So when you look at some of these statistics, they're really, really staggering. And um, the, uh, of course, coming from a pastoralist region and a, a, a county that, like Wajia County, which is actually, you can't even measure a GDP per capita of any significant magnitude yeah. just because of the massive poverty. Mm -hmm. But I'm just talking about in Kenya in general before yes. I even get to my county. Yes. Uh, there's been a lot of lip service about getting youth jobs mm -hmm. in the last 20 years, but mm -hmm. it's never been backed up by serious uh, governmental opportunities or even this. There's a lot of donor money. You know, Kenya has been sort of an experiment place for a lot of NGOs. People like coming to Kenya you know, from for Europe sure. and from the United States with all kinds of good ideas. But when you really look at, at the end of the day, it's not making a difference in people's lives. Mm -hmm. Kenyans are largely unemployed. Yes. People between the age of 18 to 34, um, st st again, statistics show close to even 40% of either unemployed or underemployed. Yes. Because the other problem is underemployment. You could get the employment, but the quality is ex in question. Exactly. Yeah. Jobs that don't have, that can't pay your living wages. Mm -hmm. You can't pay rent, but you have a job. You know, you can't get public, you can't afford transportation, but you have a job. Mm -hmm. Right? This is what we're dealing with. And I think I... I like to concur with my with my other f fellow guest mm -hmm. that I ICT sector is, is a great opportunity for Kenya. Right. Because Kenyans are very creative, they're very innovative. We just need to have the right backing um, 
to find them opportunities because when you look at, for example, the call centers, yes, many Kenyans uh, are pro prolifically English speakers. For sure. Right? Why, why should a, a country like the US look at outsourcing jobs places like India or Bangladesh or Vietnam? Kenya makes a perfect sense for call, se call, se call sector technology. Yes. There's all these companies, Google, IBM, they're all here, they have a presence in Kenya. Mm. But there haven't been a serious push from public-private opportunities to give them you know, so things like tax havens or tax breaks to incentivize them to give more jobs uh -huh. in Kenya. Uh -huh. So many companies, would, uh, we're losing um, foreign investments to places like Rwanda mm. because of just how hostile it's become for companies As to do business, business in Kenya. Environment, yeah. in the last, especially in the last 10 years, we've lost a lot of ground to countries like Tanzania, to Rwanda, where companies are looking to go elsewhere just because it's been the red tape of doing business in Kenya is very high. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, my county is even a totally different ballgame. Yes. It's, it's, it's massive poverty, mm -hmm. you know, lack of serious investment. But I'm just talking about it in the whole country. Yes. Even in places like Central Province, mm -hmm. unemployment is very high. Absolutely. And I'll get to that because you also mentioned the issue of donor organizations trying mm -hmm. to, uh, and NGOs trying to help uh, uh, Kenyan communities. But at the same time, they have been here forever. So hope we would hope that there would be yes change scene yes. but clearly there seems to be a problem in sustainability mm -hmm. now I'll go back to the issue of what the youth in Kenya are entitled to I see you have the Constitution right there and article 55 mm -hmm. actually um, it is meant to it says that the state is compelled to ensure that youth have access to relevant training and education and of course this will lead to economic empowerment but that Constitution is not self-actualizing the leaders need to actually do something about it speak yeah. to us about how you as a youth leader if you would get into our office you would do that and what are the shortfalls of those who have been in office so far? Okay, first of all, uh, when you're targeting the youth, the first concept is to re-engineer their thinking. Mm -hmm. we, we have this uh, made to believe like the economic uh, ideas being put out there, our blueprints yes. from other areas, but we are not having organic ideas. Mm -hmm. There are areas as well we can harness our youth and make them think bigger. Mm -hmm. We need big thinking from the youth. Because yes. as much as there is no jobs, especially in our graduates, you figure most of them, they have the skills, but they are not imagining big thinking, mm -hmm. thinking in big way. Like, there's a good example. I come from Nakuru and we have a sand. But if you go and ask even the youth who are there, mm -hmm. all they know about sand is sand harvesting for yeah. building. Mm -hmm. But the sand is a raw material for so many things, including microchips, including semiconductors. It might look like it's a big challenge. But first of all, we must accept we are capable of doing it. Okay. We can dig to that level. Because all we need is to extract silicon and maybe we have waivers. Mm -hmm. And then we can put ourselves in the supply chain mm -hmm. of semiconductors. Mm -hmm. But we need government support. We need readers who are thinking big. Not just in thinking in areas of, okay, agriculture is good. Yeah. Especially in value chain. Mm -hmm. But we cannot always think about agriculture. We need to re-engineer our society in ways that we are in global. If you look like we are living in a borderless uh, universe right now. Yeah. So like we say, call center. Yes. Call center is a big business. We are talking about like a, a 400, almost 40 trillion industry right there. Mm -hmm. If we can just have 1%, and you know like we talked about English proficiency. We rank number 21. Mm -hmm. Philippines is number 20. But Philippines is getting 10 trillion of the pie. Mm -hmm. Why are we not harnessing that pie? And in this country, as a matter of fact, all conditions in IT move to a level whereby this country, especially the youth, is ready for takeoff. Mm -hmm. So how do we harness that? It's government support, government support. And you know what, what we need is good leaders who understand how the, group is, uh, uh, how the group is working. And first of all, readers who are morally right, mm -hmm. who think about our people. I, I cannot cook in my mind how somebody can go buy vehicles over 100 million, <laughs> Well, in the same time, mm -hmm. you can have a factory employing like 20 young men and women, uh, right. 200 young men and women, mm -hmm. but it's about image. Mm -hmm. So we need to get that kind of readership out of the table. We bring young, youthful understanding and people who can really harness the global opportunities to create jobs for young men and women. Okay, so if you get in as governor, this is what you're going to do, this is the approach. Uh, absolutely. Okay, yeah. now one would ask, what is it that you're going to do that specifically that would make you able to... Uh, 
put forth this kind of change that the others haven't done because remember there are some young youthful leaders and we are expecting uh, Honorable Gideon Keter to join us in a moment just to talk about uh, what some of the, sh the problems are behind the scenes and how we can solve them so I mean what do you what, would, what do you say about the failure of those who have already been in power what I think is uh, about issue of social and cultural re-engineering. Mm -hmm. These are things that are not going to be maybe achieved in one or two years. Okay. But we must put ideas that already get us started. Mm. My first philosophy, if I get into leadership, is what I'm called restoration of dignity. You know, when people are poor, you take the humanity out of them. Yes. So you must have areas whereby you want to restore the dignity of the social of our young. Mm. I have an idea especially whereby that idea will go down to hitting the basic areas where poverty is hitting our people so hard because like you're saying, even if you want to come bring these people in the technical field without first accepting who they are, you're not going to get them. Okay. So my first project is uh, actually in Akuru County, I want to eliminate the issue of sanitary towels. That's a political tool for 60 years. Mm. We cannot talk mm. this again and again. Mm. And you know what? It's building a factory. A factory that is worth about 100 to 150 million will produce 650 pieces of parts per minute. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about remove the vehicles from the governor's office, build a factory, mm. create jobs, mm -hmm. and eliminate that kind of, you know, that, that kind of uh, feeling that our young girls feel. And also it will go to harness also things like inner wears. So we start getting children from that low level so they appreciate themselves. So as we introduce digital villages, especially in the informal sector, these young men and women already have that feeling of self-acceptance. Okay. I know most of the readers who are reading us do not understand this because we have a socioeconomic divide. Okay. Yeah. Now I'd like to get Mr. Abdullahi's take on yes. what failures have been there because you know we have Kazi Kwa Vijana, Kenya Youth Empowerment, um, uh, we have Wezo Fund, Youth uh, Enterprise Development Fund, Kazi Kwa Vijana that had so many people go out during the COVID times and you know try and slash, uh, well some would say that would be demeaning <laughs> for people who might be graduates and what yeah. have you. So those are programs that were set up to sort out this issue, but yes. clearly they haven't yet. So as fresh blood yes. in leadership, yes. what would you do? <coughs> First of all, I appreciate that you see us as fresh blood. Mm. I truly appreciate that. Mm. And I thank you for having us. Look, I, I, let's, let's look at the macro picture. Let's look at the 360 view. We have a problem in Kenya. Yeah. The problem is not issue of just having young leaders. We're having a real cultural crisis. If you compare the Kenya of today to the Kenya of 70s, 80s, even 90s, even as late as the mid 90s, mm -hmm. what we are having is a complete paradigm shift. For example, if I, if I, if I just may take us back for just a few years, even when my me and my colleague were even in, in primary school or secondary school, even in university, yes. there was a real social mobility. You could be the son of an administration police officer or the son of uh, even a watchman or the son of anybody. If you got good grades, you go to the amazing schools, you go to university, you got a job, right. you could be the next area MP, you could be the next cabinet secretary. Mm -hmm. That social mobility in Kenya has completely been wiped out. Uh -huh. And it's largely because of the political class, the political elites, and the, the complete integration of national institutions. Right. We have really changed our culture in such a way that when I was young growing up, you know, a college professor who had a Volkswagen Beetle you know, was respected. People yes. stopped in the streets for them. Yes. Now, if you don't have a Prado or a Range Rover, nobody cares about who you are. Mm -hmm. uh, you could have, you know, 10 PhDs, you could, be the, you could be the greatest innovator in the whole universe. No one cares. You could be a priest, an imam, a rabbi, nobody cares. Yeah. So we're having a real erosion of our ethos in this country. That, I think, is what I have not seen many people really describe to be the problem. Because mm -hmm. it's easy to, you've mentioned so many pro programs in the last just one minute. Yeah. You rattled out all these great things. Mm -hmm. All those things are nice just on a paper, or on a website, but come to implementation. Why are they difficult to implement? Because our culture and ethos have changed substantially. Uh -huh. Every Kenyan, irrespective of where they are on the economic ladder, is looking to eat mm -hmm. from the opportunity they get. Uh -huh. This is a massive erosion. No one cares about helping a neighbor, or no one even cares about helping a poor family in the village to pay their school fees. Everyone says, Niki pata fursa, ntakula. See, yeah. this has become the culture, yeah, right? Yeah. From the top to the bottom. Mm. This is really eroding our society. Even churches are corrupt, mosques are corrupt. Places you would never have thought yeah. that there would be corruption. 
Everybody, in, in the past, in the past, mm -hmm. even when there was a polit every country has a certain aspect of a political corruption. Yes. This is normal. You go to India, you go to the US, Canada, it doesn't matter. But those countries, they are really minimal and on the outliers. Mm. They are not the norm. In Kenya, it's become the Institutionalized. norm. Institutionalized. This is really the problem. I think any great ideas are good on paper, even getting young people in government. It's going to do a small change. Mm -hmm. Real radical change takes Kenyans to have a conversation. Where are we headed? Right. Why have we fallen so much into the pitfall? Mm -hmm. How have we fallen so far in such a way that our society only... If you don't eat, they think you're stupid. I mean, this has become the culture in this country. Right. We need to really reverse well, what would it what's take? happening. What would it take to reverse I think it that? would take leadership. I'm mm -hmm. glad that my, my colleague mentioned leadership. Mm -hmm. It's going to take radical change in how we approach leadership. What do I mean by this? If, if we look at the size of government, we have an unsustainable, massive growth of government. Why? Because government has become the only place to really economically empower yourself. Mm -hmm. So... so so we have 47 counties, 47 county assemblies with cabinet level secretaries and peers at the county level. Yes. And then you have a national government. What we need to look at first is to, if, you, if we get an opportunity, right? And I'm not even talking about which political party or who wins this. Kenyans need to have a conversation about having at least putting a stop to the growth of government or at least reducing the, growth, the yes. size of government. Yes. Secondly, we need to empower the private sector because there's a lot of good people in the Kenyan private sector mm -hmm. who actually care about this country, who want jobs for the Kenyan people. Yes. Then thirdly, we need to seriously empower our institutions, meaning there should be a check on corruption. There should be serious, the, the, the judiciary should be empowered to make decisions independent of, of, of the executive. Right. And parliament needs to get serious about, about not just going there to have fancy jobs and fancy cars, but actually executing change so that Kenyan's lives get better. Mm. We, this might take 20 years. You know, it, didn't, it, it took us 20 to maybe 25 years to get to where we are. Mm -hmm. It might take us 20 years to reverse what has happened, but we need to start encouraging people going back to school. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of young people now are asking, why should I stay in school for What's 20 years? Point, yeah. When somebody who was not, you know, a dropout in from two becomes, you know, any, has, has 25 cars, mm -hmm. you know, unfortunately even maybe many girlfriends, they're fancied in social media. Yeah. This is the other problem. Mm -hmm. Social media is eroding the ethos of this country. It's a global problem. Right. But for a small country like Kenya with 47 to 50 million people, to have this massive celebrity worship of even consuming global content like the US yes. and big people thinking, oh, that fancy life is possible mm -hmm. without really staying in school, thinking about delaying gratification. Doing the work. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Any good thing takes 20 years plus to do. Mm -hmm. Our people don't think like that anymore. Everybody wants that fancy car. Everybody wants that fancy house. And people would have been killed for it. And this is the danger that we have in this country. Mm -hmm. and we need to have a national conversation about what's happening to the ethos and the character of the country. Absolutely. And speaking of change, we have Honorable uh, Gideon Kitter joining us from our Nakuru uh, Bureau just to shed light on his um, efforts to ensure there's a change for young people who are seeking employment by putting forth the Employment Amendment Bill. He was hoping to ensure it is easier for young people just to get into the door instead of being made to jump through hurdles uh, even before they have gotten a job offer. So, Honorable uh, Keter, could you unpack the bill and what your purpose for it is? Uh, good morning, can you hear me? Yes. Loud and clear. Hello. We can hear you loud and clear, yes. You can hear me, thank you. Uh, for, for a long time, uh, many, many job seekers have been having hurdles when they, when they try to seek for employment. Normally, uh, many of the Kenyans, many of the graduates normally don't get even an opportunity to appear before an interview panel uh, simply because of uh, they've been asked to uh, to provide so many unnecessary documents before they appear before an employer. For instance, uh, a graduate who just graduated must, all, must prove that he's, uh, he's not a thief, mm -hmm. must prove that he has not done business, must prove that uh, uh, he, he or she has never borrowed uh, any loan. He or she must, must prove also that uh, he has never participated in any corruption. He or she must also prove that he, they don't have a loan. So if you look at all these documents, what is the relations between an employer and all these other proofs besides the certificates that uh, we've been, they've managed to acquire in the universities? So you find the uh, entire country has been crippled by a law that was forcing many 
many young Kenyans or many job seekers instead of uh, seeking opportunities to get themselves out of uh, and many entanglements they've had in life, they have been forced to uh, to, pro to provide so many all these documents. So when you when when I was able to look at the gap and the problems that are affecting job seekers, that was a major major main crisis. And uh, if you look at the DCI offices, the EACC offices the carry offices, the CRB offices, and uh, which other one? Uh, all these offices, they're not centralized. Many people who, or many residents of the villages were not able to access these, these, these offices and access this certificate, and to make it even worse, it is renewable. And uh, normally when an opportunity appears or is being advertised, you normally find a text, it has a, sp a short time span, maybe two weeks or three weeks for you to, de to deliver. And then you are eliminated before even, you're, even if you had a, you, you passed, you got an A, you got a first class. But if, as long as you have a loan with Okash, an employer will not give you a job simply because Okash has listed you in CRB. So um, this was merely discrimination, discrimination and marginalization of some, uh, some people in, in, in the country uh, by, by structure. I mean, this is by structure. So Employment Amendment Bill was trying to cure the discrimination around uh, uh, employees who are looking for jobs. So the cure is uh, if no employer should actually ask anybody to provide any of these documents, apart from the university certificates, apart from uh, your ID and, and your CV and your university certificate, appear first before the interview. Go through the process. If you have the talent for the job, may you be given an opportunity to showcase that you are able to do it. Then as, as soon as you're done and uh, the, the employer has seen now that you, you are okay, now they can ask you to provide now, maybe if there's any criminal background checks they want to confirm with you, they can. But it doesn't have to be whole documents as well. It just have to be a few related. I can give an example. If Kenya police is recruiting, they can continue recruiting. But uh, at to a point where when you have qualified is when they ask you, if you qualify, now you have to provide the DCI so that we know you are not a criminal. You, or you don't, your fingerprints have not been matched somewhere for a, a certain criminal activity. But recruitment of police and, and KRA and, 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 and a higher education laws board, what is the relations? Another thing, we have, uh, through our taxpayers' money, we pay KRA. If KRA has a problem with me or an employer or, or a job seeker, let the KRA go for that person. If higher education has a problem with someone, let higher education go for that person. If, uh, if, if ESCC has a problem with someone, that office, may that office go after that someone. But if you give every employer to every now and then vet a job seeker that uh, you've given uh, everybody to be checking all these documents, it, it is frustrates. It, okay. it, it marginalizes the people living in villages. And, and you, you find, uh, if you look at, if you look at the spread of employment opportunities, only the urban centers have been benefiting because these offices are also near uh, urban centers. But you go to the villages, the poor areas, you find in the poor areas, uh, many s candidates who have scored well, they are, they are very brilliant, they have talent, they've never moved out of those villages simply because of these requirements of the documents and the, as soon as you get it, and ABCD and ABCD. And, 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 and to jump from that one, if you look at the Public Service Commission, the PSC, the largest, the supposed largest employer in, in the country, they have been playing the same game as well. They have been the, the biggest letdown in our country. That commission is, uh, on it, uh, uh, the Commission of Public Service alone has actually messed up the employment sector because they are the people who, have, who should have noted this thing way, way, way before. And if you look at now the, uh, the, the job jobs they have created uh, in the past, I can give a statistic of 2018, 2019. You find a whole government, Public Service Commission, only employing 1,800 vis-a-vis uh, the, the number, of, um, number of graduates we normally uh, uh, get them out of the university is close to 800 to, to a million in a year. And, and, and you look at the largest employer employing 1,800. So there has been a problem. Public service also have been doing politics with, our, with, with, with job seekers and, and the young people in the country. They have been doing politics in this way. They pretend they are advertising, there's an advertisement for a job, 
to be seen as if they are actually going to give an opportunity and then you find that opportunity remains pending for a whole two years nobody is being called All for right. an interview um, nobody is being called for for, for any review. Honorable Keter, while these might be no noble changes that you're seeking to see, speak to us about what your view is about the political goodwill because in order to see everything that has been set up, even all the programs that were set up that seem not to be working, lack, there was a lack of political goodwill and an element of corruption that you have just mentioned that stood in the way of them actually making sure there's good change for the young people of Kenya. So even with your bill, do you see political goodwill that would actually see it sail through and actually change the lives of job seekers in this country? Uh, the goodwill, first of all, is overwhelming. There was nobody who opposed it. There was nobody who even questioned it. Uh, it didn't stop anywhere. Just straight from uh, my intervention to the committee level, all the way to the president signing, it didn't change. No, no, the, the goodwill was, it was a welcome from all quarters. Actually, nobody could have thought about it if, uh, if, if we, I thank the Constitution of Kenya for at least recognizing that in every city there should be a young person because nobody will have thought about curing this problem. Everybody will be thinking about other things. They will be thinking about BBI, they will be thinking about other health problems and, and, the, and their quarters. But simply because I was able to sit and and, and discuss with the job seekers. I had enough time with the youth who had called them in, into parliament in the year 2018, International Youth Day, where every young, two, two young people came from every constituency in the country, and they were able to raise these issues. They were able to raise an issue on uh, the voice of young people within the government. They were able to raise this issue. They were able, the, the issue of employment and these <coughs> requirements of this document. They were able to raise a uh, uh, the problems of higher education loans board, the interest rates and, and, the, and the penalties. They were able to raise uh, issues on youth justice, around the sector around youth justice, issues on uh, if a young person, if, if a 17-year-old boy play with a 16-year-old girl, you find a 17-year-old old boy being punished more than the, 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 the girl. They raised so many other issues. So when it comes to issues on youth, I think the whole country was united. This specific, this specific one, Nobody opposed, even during the second reading, yes, the yes. third reading. The only problem that I had in, in Parliament is mm. this. Is a, it, legislation takes a lot of time. I have to queue. As a, as a youth representative, I had to queue along 349 members of Parliament. So it, it took time because this is an issue I was able to... I, I knew it because I was a youth leader of the party and I knew this is the main problem and uh, I was able to act on it immediately in 2018 okay. because we were sworn in in 2017 and then uh, by 2018 I was able to take it all the way to the committee stage and remember from 2018 to date to 2022 is when I'm able to cure something very small which needed uh, on, I, I think I think I think I can only speak on the goodwill in this way if if it if the government of the day decides to take some such important and painful matters on, it, on its hand, a uh, leader of majority could easily be able to fast track issues like this. So I now, only, uh, let I me, can only pick, pick those ideas. Yeah, let me bring in our, our panel here in studio. Mr. Siad, take a look at that time that it took for this to, to sail through. I mean, if you're talking about political goodwill, even the willingness of politicians but, uh, could, be, could be there, but then at the same time, you're having all this red tape and bureaucracy, so by the time you're seeing change, you're actually move, getting out of office. I mean, sp speak to us about that. First of all, I appreciate uh, Moshima Kater's uh, efforts to do this. It's, uh, you can just see what the difference he made by being, by being in parliament, to have a young person to be in parliament. So I, I commend him for doing that. The problem for me is, is when it comes to implementation. There's all these good laws on the books. The problem becomes when, when they're implemented. If, for example, he brought up the issue of, the, you know, of someone being cleared for a job. Mm -hmm. I think employers have a right to have a screening process for their employees because you're taking people into your building. They're probably going to have business cards that have their name. Or they might even have access to critical information about your company. Mm. Cash, handling cash. So it's okay for an employer to have some aspect of a screening. Yes. The problem is... At every level, what he's speaking to, that I am afraid that, you know, even with good laws might be difficult to still do, mm -hmm. is when that young job seeker goes to get a job, at every level they have to partake with some, some 
um, what, you know, TKK or yeah. some library mm -hmm. to get, you know, you get, you need to, you get, you need to get a DCI to clear this. You need to get thing, background check. You need, they're, they're paying at every level. For they sure. might even be paying to get an interview, mm -hmm. an interview just mm -hmm. at that employee. Yeah. Then be, for them to even get an interview, they might have to know someone who knows someone at that company. This is what has really changed from the Kenyans of the 80s and the 90s. Right. It's, it's this, this complex in which every gatekeeper wants to monetize For sure. their gatekeeping, right? Mm -hmm. So we have a lot of good laws on the books, and I commend this one as well. Mm -hmm. But I, I want us to even take a step further to say, how do we, how do we change this cultural phenomenon of gatekeepers having young people to pay mm -hmm. and, and having young people to find political benefactors to get these things? I think one of the solutions potentially mm -hmm. is when, Ken, the, when Kenya's workforce gets paid a lot better, potentially, people yeah might say, okay, you know, I don't have to make money out of pocket at yes. my job to have a living wage. Yes. Maybe that might alleviate the problem. Yeah, I was Maybe. about to say it points to a larger poverty problem yes. that everyone yes. seems to be facing. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I'm not saying these laws are not important. They're mm. very important. Mm -hmm. The question is implementation. Absolutely. How can we make sure that these things are implemented, that the laws on the books are actually implemented, that young people have less spec tape? Mm -hmm. Small businesses have the same problem as well. Mm -hmm. They can't access credit. They have the same issues to, to get clear. If you're you a small business owner, and you know, and you're trying to get access to bank. They don't have access to banks. They are not bankable. They don't have access to credit. Mm -hmm. If they don't have a rich relative who could help them out, these people are out languishing. Mm -hmm. And some of these small businesses have good ideas. They can actually employ other people. A lot of the jobs in this country come from small businesses, mm -hmm. but they've been left out largely. You know, you see a nice, you hear a nice initiative and a nice report. Right. But it's really not implemented. When you go to the, across the 47 counties and you look at rural areas, our small businesses have not even heard of these national programs right. of, of helping SMEs. Mm -hmm. And, and, and the, before we go, go on break, I'd like to get your view on this also, goodwill, and also just eliminating the red tape so that some of these things really sail through quickly enough to, to, so that we can see change. Okay, uh, first of all, if I go back and concur with my colleague here, mm -hmm. who, who he was trying to erode, where he said, what we need is minimum government and maximum governance. Uh -huh. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, youth is a station in life. We are over amplified. Mm -hmm. well, these people are going to grow old. It's just a process of where they're going to get. We have young people who will start reading and stealing. You know, it's, it's, it, you cannot take it as a solution to the challenges we have. Mm -hmm. We have to look at, we go back to history, because if you want to know where you're going, look back to your history. Mm -hmm. uh, there was opportunities for Kapenguria 6 to. <laughs> To agree with the colonial government and get jobs. Sure. They were all youth. Absolutely. Yeah, they refused. There was an opportunity for Raila Odinga uh, Jamurogi to be president. He refused because he was principal. Mm -hmm. These young men right now in government have an opportunity to resign if the government is not working. If they have anything going for them morally, mm -hmm. if they want to change this country, they don't have to answer lallies and talk about frustrations. Yes. There comes a time. When a nation needs a change, we are where we are saying right now we have a gap where we have to change this nation. Mm -hmm. The statistics are staggering, and if we don't have a peaceful revolution in this country, right. we're going to have a violent one. Let's be there, because if you look at okay. the statistics. All right, Honorable Karan, uh, one second.